Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great honor to have been invited back following the successful first summit in 2012 to speak once again at this important event. I want to introduce an area that I think now deserves systematic further study. But today I want to present some largely undigested data which throws up questions that need more precise answers. My point of departure is a series of puzzles that have arisen as a result of a large number of external audits and reviews that I've carried out with colleagues over the last 10 years. Most of these reviews have been to examine academic standards and outcomes performance for undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in colleges and universities. Specifically, in the last four or five years, I've become increasingly perplexed by the gap between the results of our audits and the results of the internal audits the institutions themselves have carried out prior to our arrival. Such a gap between auditor and institution, of course, rapidly becomes a problem for the institution to address. The puzzle is that while some of these institutions seem to think they are performing well against international standards and achieving outcomes of a high standard, our audits suggest otherwise that to a greater or lesser extent, academic standards at the level we would expect are not being met. Now, all these institutions are subject to a national regulatory authority and consequently any weaknesses that external auditors uncovered led to remedial action that ensured that appropriate levels of performance were eventually met. And moreover, although this presentation concentrates on specific weaknesses, these failures to meet international standards are by no means pervasive throughout these sectors. Naturally, all or almost all institutions have some kind of quality assurance framework in operation. These vary in complexity, scale and organisation. Typically, they attempt to review and assure the performance of both institutional services and academic programmes. Institutional services typically cover student services, academic services and administrative services. And while these have something in common with one another, the approach that is taken to them is usually very different from that taken for academic programmes. And I want to concentrate in this presentation on systems of programme effectiveness. That's to say, I want to look at those frameworks of quality assurance and enhancement and assess the extent to which the delivery of academic programmes achieves outcomes at an appropriate level. As I've already hinted, my puzzle is that whilst these institutions have frameworks for programme effectiveness that are actively, busily collecting and analysing data, the results they produce are very often quite out of line with the results of the independent inspection that arises through the external audit process. Clearly, something is missing and something is very wrong. In a moment, I want to look at an anonymous set of 18 institutions taken from across the much broader family that I described earlier. The one thing that these 18 have in common is that external audit revealed that, to a greater or lesser extent, they were not achieving the academic standards that their own internal quality processes were claiming. These institutions are not all from the same higher education jurisdiction, but they are all from rapidly developing higher education sectors, and they are examples of the rapid growth in private higher education that we have been seeing worldwide over the last decade or so. As I mentioned earlier, the weaknesses I exemplified by these institutions are not pervasive throughout the sectors from which they are drawn. I'm deliberately concentrating on these weaknesses and ignoring, at least for the moment, the very good work done by many other institutions within the same jurisdictions. And I should also say that this is not a picture of one of them. Of course, I want to keep the location and the name of these institutions entirely anonymous. I don't intend what I'm saying today to be a systematic statistical analysis. I think a more systematic analysis would be interesting, but at this stage we just need to turn the puzzle into something like a hypothesis, something that could be tested rigorously against data that would, for example, include a control group of successful institutions. But we must start where we must start, with some evidence that could trigger such a systematic analysis in future. But before looking at the data, I want to make some basic observations about tools for outcomes assessment, whether those are the outcomes of service units or the achievement of academic outcomes and goals of academic programmes. I want to do this because we should understand the complexity of the task with which we're involved. 
My first observation concerns the alignment of tools with tasks. It's foolish to try and cut grass with a pair of scissors or to try and clean the floor with a toothbrush. We need to choose the right tool for every task we have to undertake and we need to find a perfect alignment between the tool and the task in order to complete the task effectively. Some mismatched tools may get us some way towards achieving our goals, but the results may be unpredictable. Tools can be very simple or they may be complex, but it is clear that frameworks for outcomes assessment and quality assurance and enhancement processes are complex instruments. Moreover, they're not just any tool. They're tools for making measurements and they need to be reliable. Such measuring tools need to be regularly calibrated and this is what we often find to be missing from the systems of quality assurance, these systems for outcomes assessment which we encounter in our reviews. And they are complex systems of measurement involving many dimensions and requiring the careful integration of results. Triangulation as much as combination, a point I'll come back to in a moment. First, let's look at the profile of the failure of these 18 institutions. On a scale of 1, least significant failure, to 5, most significant failure, this is a rough assessment made on the basis of the auditor's reports. Among the most significant failures would be failures in academic delivery and assessment, failures to deliver and or assess academic programmes at a level comparable with other institutions in the jurisdiction that are meeting international standards of comparability, or indeed against a number of national qualifications frameworks that set out what qualifications of various levels should achieve within that jurisdiction. What we see is a spread with the increasing likelihood that institutions or parts of them will be suspended from operating their programmes pending remedial action. In other words, there are here some very significant failures at audit. Note the single institution on the left with the least serious problem. I'll come back to that later. Let's start with calibration. Tools need calibrating either regularly or continuously. We can start with regular calibration. We would expect to find that within an institution's framework for quality assurance and enhancement that there is some system for assessing the quality processes themselves. Looking at the documentation supplied by each of these 18 institutions, we find that only eight of them had any such regular self-review. Well, there's really no point in showing you the data for continuous calibration because there was no evidence of that in any of the institutions. Let me be clear about what I mean here. When we design a tool for outcomes assessment, we involve a variety of assessment instruments. And we do this partly because some outcomes are better measured by one instrument rather than another. Course level learning outcomes, for example, can be measured by quantitative in-course and end-of-course assessment. Whereas other objectives, say employability, are better assessed by qualitative employer and alumni surveys. These various measures are then integrated to obtain an overall picture of health. However, multiple measures are often contradictory and usefully so. The contradictions can be used to recalibrate the system, to explore its limits and to correct them. It's perhaps surprising that while such continuous self-correction and calibration is common, indeed pervasive in engineering, it's much less often encountered in practice in quality management. Just taking the eight institutions that included a regular review of the quality system itself, we find further disappointments. In two cases, the review amounts to a satisfaction survey of the quality office performance. Stakeholders, for example, the staff of the offices that the quality office reviews, provide their views on the implementation of quality processes as it affects them. In four cases, the quality office is measured for compliance against KPIs, and those KPIs include measurements uh, such as the timely production of analysed data, meeting the deadline set out by the quality audit cycle, and compliance with external regulatory authorities. In one case, a very confused picture is presented in which the quality office is measured against the performance of the units or functions that it's reviewing. For example, 
the quality officer's success is tied to the overall success of the institution in delivering academic programmes that meet outcomes at levels of international comparability. This case, and to a large extent the first case I described, creates a serious conflict of interests. It is, of course, in the interests of the quality office to simply satisfy those that it's reviewing and to come up with results that demonstrate institutional success rather than doing a professional job of review and assessment. In only one case was any mechanism for benchmarking or independently assessing the framework for quality monitoring itself present. And that institution involves an independent external reviewer to provide a separate assessment of academic standards, thus achieving a regular calibration of internal measures. And perhaps it's not surprising to note that that institution, the one I mentioned earlier in fact, exhibited the least serious failings amongst the 18 institutions we've been considering. Another important difference between quality frameworks is the link between service and academic quality assessment. There is, of course, a much greater need to involve faculty members, academic staff, in the outcomes assessment processes for academic programmes, and in much greater numbers than, for example, in the assessment of student services or the Human Resources Unit. Now, in tackling this issue, the 18 institutions were largely split between quality offices that largely owned the assessment of processes and those that effectively delegated the entire process to the faculties and departments that delivered them. It seems that in some institutions, quality offices are so daunted by the prospect of dealing with academic staff that they prefer not to try to engage with them at all. The approaches taken by central offices of quality assurance vary. Some delegate the entire matter of process and implementation to academic units. Some set out a process that academic units must implement and some own the process and drive its implementation with the support of the academic units. A central component within all 18 institutions is the course file. This is a document that captures for each presentation of a course information relevant to that presentation. Course materials, assessment instruments, model answers, data concerning student achievement and very often a course review undertaken at the end of the semester by the instructor. In the institutions that delegated to some extent or wholly the implementation of programme review to the academic units that own them, the quality officer's role is only to ensure that course files are compiled, complete and lodged in the office. In other words, they adopt an entirely compliance approach that academic staff unsurprisingly find pointless, because it is, and annoying. The academic departments themselves often make no use of the course files in their own implementation of quality processes, in many cases because they no longer have access to them. Course instructors very often fail to make an accurate self-assessment in their end of semester course reports. Perhaps they fear they'll themselves be blamed for any weaknesses they might identify. And it's also perhaps unsurprising that detailed inspection of these course files during the audit is often the source of the evidence that demonstrates that academic standards are not being met at the appropriate level and that all the busy work, the often enormous amount of work that is undertaken in the name of internal quality review, is effectively wasted time and effort. As we know, a system is only as strong as its weakest component all the effort in the world expended on ineffective methods will never yield useful results. Higher education institutions are very complex organisations, perhaps more complex than most other businesses. Their core business is multifaceted and measuring success effectively in some areas, particularly in the education of students, is an enormous challenge. In some institutions, particularly smaller institutions in rapidly expanding higher education sectors, part of the system is broken and it needs fixing. Two areas need attention. First, a more thorough approach at institution level to programme review. And second, what I called in the title, meta-quality, a review of the system of review itself, one that properly tests the outcomes assessment tools for their effectiveness. This is by no means easy. In fact, it's extremely difficult, but it is necessary. Systems of quality assurance are very complex tools and institutions are all very different from one another. The systems have to be created to fit uniquely those different institutions and they need 
constant re-evaluation to ensure that they are fit for purpose. Without such effective systems, we are walking blind and potentially towards disaster. What we need are complete, robust, self-regulating outcomes assessment tools that ensure and enhance quality. We need to repair any gaps we have in our existing systems and we should ensure that the effort we expend in operating our systems is effort and time that is well spent. As I said at the beginning, there is much more to be done to explore these issues more thoroughly. If any of you listening has access to relevant data and is interested, please do get in touch with me. Or if you're trying to develop specific outcomes assessment tools for quality assurance and enhancement in your own institution and you want to explore some of the ideas I've outlined, then again, please do get in touch. And if you want to review what I've said during this presentation, then you'll find it to listen to again on my website as shown here. Thank you for your kind attention. It's been a pleasure to present to you this afternoon.